Good afternoon, I'm Helen Hughes. In tonight's news, new arrivals at the Gosford Reptile Park, including a 100 kilo Galapagos tortoise straight from Adelaide Zoo. For all the news, join us tonight at, at six. six. It was a hive of activity at the ground today as the TV lights and equipment went into place. It may seem like a lot of work for a football match, but it's a major part of rugby league these days, and the pot of gold at the end of it all sees the winner receive over $100,000 in prize money. And the money on the way to that is well worth the effort. The Parramatta team for the game is a new look one with plenty of big names out injured, including, including international, international Peter Sterling, Sterling, Sterling Brent Brent Kenny, 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 Eric, Eric Growth, Growth. Rothman's Roth medal winner, winner Jeff Bugden is also, also sidelined with a broken hand. But anyone that underestimates an injured eel is in trouble, as the youngsters now given a chance are all stars of the future, maybe even of the present. North Sydney are just about intact, with a view of Mark Graham in full flight well worthy of the trip to the ground. And his New Zealand teammate Clayton Friend is also in fine form. It's really a trip back home for hooker Rex Wright, who played for New South Wales a couple of years ago. Norths will go in favourites, but that means little once the game gets underway. $27 million bridge will carry northbound traffic. At this stage, it's only being fed by the Newcastle ramp. But by June, the feeder ramp from Maitland will be completed. Until then, the old bridge will remain two-way, servicing the motorists from the New England Highway. The bridge was jointly opened by the Federal Minister for Transport, Peter Morris, and the State Minister for Roads, Laurie Brereton. The project was financed by the Commonwealth as part of the National Roads Program, and the State Government was project manager. Ministers say the opening of the bridge before Easter will ease the usual congestion at Hexham as holiday makers travel north. The contract to build six replacement submarines for the Australian Navy was originally costed at $2.6 billion. Latest figures from the Defence Department suggest the project could blow out to more than $5 billion, making the economic impact much greater for whichever state wins the assembly site. Latest word from Canberra is that the Swedish design for the subs is favoured over the German design, but that it is more costly. It's also believed that both consortiums have South Australia and Newcastle within cooey on the basis of costs, but that South Australia could be winning the political battle. Exercise and South Australia has clearly shown them up. The Premier from South Australia has won the day and has obviously convinced the company's concern that they should look favourably at the South Australian option. New South Wales has failed very miserably in this attempt and the Premier stands condemned for his lack of activity. I can tell you the Premier Unsworth is really putting his uh, weight behind this one. Today's public meeting at City Hall saw speakers call for community help. The message is that concerned citizens should be writing to the Prime Minister and the Minister for Defence, Kim Beasley, to let them know what impact the contract would have on the people of this region. I think we're in the, in the, in the final stage of that decision-making process. I think it is partly a toss-up as to who finally wins it and the kind of support that we're able to muster in Newcastle could well be quite vital in that final decision.
Two arguments have weighed heavily against Newcastle recently. Newcastle has still been portrayed as a centre with a poor industrial record. The sub-task force has moved to dispel this belief by printing this table in today's financial review. It shows that less time was lost through strikes on construction projects in the Hunter Valley than in South Australia. The second major problem for New South Wales was the high workers' compensation costs, relevant in a project which may ultimately employ more than 6,000 people. The New South Wales Task Force says recent changes to compensation must be considered by those key decision makers in Canberra. Speakers were also critical of suggestions that coming down to the line, politics will determine the decision. Um, we can't stand back and say it's got to be settled politically, we've got to say the national arguments are right and our arguments are national arguments. It's not a political solution but sometimes you've got to make sure that you let the politicians know that you know those arguments are there and that they won't be able to get away with making a political decision. I don't believe they will on this one. I think they'll recognise those arguments. Every year around Easter time, the smell of freshly cooked bones walks down the streets, and it all starts from here. Inside New Orleans Bank House at Adamstown, this faithfulness machine has been hard at work for the past 40 years. After the basic ingredients of like flour, yeast, sugar, spices and fruit are added, the dough is ready to be separated and moulded. And Chief Cook Norma Whittigan knows just how it's done, because she's had 45 years of practice. To give the buns their traditional cross topping, a sugar glaze is used before the batch is placed in the oven. And when they're golden brown, it's onto the shelves. Norma insists there are no special ingredients to her now famous buns, but says their success comes from just good old fashioned service. Well, let's say we do it the hard way. We do it by hand. <laughs> the initial bun is mixed in the machine. But then from then on, everything's done by hand. And uh, even the measuring and everything, as you know, is done by hand. Is that how other bakeries do it? Well, I don't really know, but I think the big bakeries would have machines to turn out the buns because they turn out thousands, don't they? But the biggest test can only come from those who know best. Well, my wife and myself and my family, we've been coming here for, for 30 years, and that's as long as we've lived in Adamstown. And uh, we've lived in different places in Newcastle, and we've found that these are the best hot crust buns. Anyone wanting to buy hot crust buns? The chief trouble spots of Swansea, Charlestown and Hexham are all free of traffic hold-ups today after travellers experienced some long delays yesterday. The new bridge at Hexham has made a large difference to traffic flowing north over the Hunter, with three lanes replacing one. Over the long weekend, police are maintaining a high profile on the region's roads, 
However, Sergeant Terry Devonshire of Newcastle Highway Patrol says that overall motorists are behaving responsibly. Well, there were extremely bad conditions, uh, but fortunately I can say that in the Newcastle Police District, uh, for the duration of our holiday uh, traffic surveillance program, we have not had one fatal to date, which is very good considering the amount of wet weather that we did have. Sergeant Devonshire says that the coincidence of the Easter break with the new position of the school holidays means the volume of traffic on the roads at this time has increased. I think we'll find that traditionally this will be uh, the period of the year where we have the highest concentration volume of traffic uh, departing out of basically the Sydney area at the one time. Much of the frustrating delay of Easter Monday travel has this year been substantially reduced, perhaps for good. The coincidence of the Easter break with the new position of the school holidays means many travellers are choosing to come south later in the week. Traffic at the usual travel spots of Swansea and Hexham was experiencing only minimum hold-ups today. According to Sergeant Kevin Curry of Charlestown Highway Patrol, removing the delays is an important part of their Easter road strategy. Well, we find that uh, if motorists are delayed for a long period of time, they try to make up that time uh, later on down the roadway. If we can minimise the delays in the Newcastle area and keep the traffic flowing, we're quite sure that the motorists will cooperate and assist us by maintaining a slower rate of speed. Two and a half thousand motorists have been stopped for random breath testing or traffic offences over the last four days. Sergeant Curry says that police are not yet winding down their intense Easter operations. We've rostered police right through the daylight and hours of darkness. This evening we've got a maximum uh, number of police for uh, stationary radar and random breath testing. And at Raymond Terrace this morning a semi-trailer overturned but did not block the Pacific Highway. It toppled away from the road spilling its load onto the footpath. The heavy vehicle, fully laden with $100,000 worth of CIG welding equipment, failed to negotiate the right-hand bend at the intersection of the highway and Swan Street. The corner is notorious for its awkward camber. Fifteen semi-trailers have overturned there in as many years. The driver, Ronald Ivory from Kerry Bay, was treated at the Mata Hospital for minor cuts and abrasions. Carlson, rated as one of the best ever players to have graced the football fields of the world, died suddenly last week at the age of 54. It shocked not only the Trump people of Newcastle, New but of the rugby league the world as well. He was that sort of guy, talented beyond Carlson belief, coming up, sending this but as is the way of genuine and champions, right modest to the a post. fault. And they came from everywhere to see him off. It was not a case of standing room only. They spilled into the streets to pay their respects. Chairman of the International Board, the Australian and New South Wales Rugby Leagues, Ken Arthurson, was one of the first to signify Carlson's standing with his presence. But if you'd wound the clock back, he could have picked a team to beat all teams. Raper, Gasnia, Langman, Irvine, Pickup, Wells, Allen, Thompson, Diamond, Boom, Boom, Barnes, Quayle and many, many more. The people who'd made it to the top by their presence spoke volumes for Brian the Man and the Footballer. Some of his local mates in the had thousands. Reg Date, Alf Fidden, John Snedd and John Harvey and John Onslow helped son Martin carry Dad to his peace. Who will forget the skinny kid from Rome, who left his name in the annals of rugby league for all time? Carlo strode the field majestically and left in similar style. He would have loved to have been there at the wake of South as a doctor club to have a drink with his mates. Vale, Brian, Patrick and Carlson.
Blaine Light Graham Pitts is well known for his humorous satires. The power authority behind his latest work is the public service, with all its red tape and frustration. And all the research work was done here in Newcastle. This is real! Now, Graham Pitts, the writer, has been here for nine months and talking to public servants for about that time, getting things together, listening to lots of stories that have been happening in offices around Newcastle. The play is set here in an office in Newcastle, so he's been putting all that into the play so people will really um, identify with lots of things happening. Meanwhile, Federal Minister for Transport and Aviation, Peter Morris, officially launched the Newcastle Dramatic Art Club's Golden Anniversary Appeal. Next year, the club will celebrate 50 years of performances in opera, musical comedy, children's theatre and drama in the Hunter region. But as times have changed, so have the needs of the club. And now they're appealing for financial help to extend and upgrade the Roxy Theatre in Hamilton. We want to extend the foyer so that it'll give us more room and toilets in the front of the theatre rather than having to walk through to the back. We want to lift the height of the stage so we can fly things and build a three vehicle garage on the property next door which we own. A big police search of the area has begun. Police say it appears the woman had been stabbed and strangled with a bra. They do not know how long the body had been there. However, they think the woman is from Mayfield area. The rescue helicopter is also being used to scour the area for possible clues. This is a recent picture of the murdered woman. She was 28-year-old prostitute working the Islington area, Cheryl Ann Virtual. Two boys, 12-year-old Bruce Taylor and 9-year-old Anthony Tattersall, made the grizzly find on the banks of Throsby Creek at about 9 o'clock this morning while they were looking for timber to build a cubby house. I thought there was a, um, a dummy and then I told him to come over and he, did, and he, he said he thought it was a dummy too. Detectives and the scientific squad were quickly on the scene and the area was cordoned off. The Westpac helicopter was seconded to allow aerial photos to be taken of the body and its location. Police say the murdered woman was found semi-naked with the bra that she'd been strangled with still tied around her neck. They also said that she'd been stabbed several times with a long thin bladed knife. All available police were brought in to search the area for the knife and any other clues to the murder. Divers also began the search of Throsby Creek late this afternoon. Detective now, in charge of the case, Sergeant Jeff Wright. Away from the body there was a pool of blood, small pool of blood found, and uh, from there there was drag marks which lead over to where the body was actually found. Do you believe she was murdered here? At this stage our yeah, inquiries uh, believe that she may have been murdered elsewhere. Is there any motive for this murder? No, not at this stage. week-long trip to Launceston in Tasmania, it was all smiles from both the senior and junior band members, but in particular the younger players. The Broadmeadow High School and Community Senior Band came second in the national championships, but the juniors took out their A-grade division and the coveted cup. The Lord Mayor of Newcastle, John McNaughton, was the first one to congratulate them. But according to band conductor Peter Boyce, despite last year's second placing in the event, it wasn't an easy win. Uh, no, there was a protest, but that's band competitions. It's part and parcel, technical protest. We lost it for about two hours after we'd won it. And the kids were very down, and then the national delegates met, and they said it wasn't good enough. Uh, they gave it back to us, and we had two wins in a day, as it were. The kids were elated. Well, the Broadmeadow Concert Band is now the best in Australia. Where to now? To win senior A grade by 89.
It's the travelling milko that's been hit the hardest by the cheap Victorian milk prices now appearing in supermarkets. The milk trade war has meant that vendors have lost customers because they can't compete in the marketplace. From today, the cost of a two litre plastic carton will fall by nine cents and a 600 milliliter bottle by three cents. The counter move resulted from the meeting of 150 angry local vendors at Hexham yesterday, who voted to make their prices equal to those found in the supermarkets. Subsidised by the Dairy Industry Authority, the Milkos will be delivering pamphlets throughout the Hunter advertising the new prices, and they're confident of regaining lost sales. Who would bother walking down the street and buying milk when they can have it home delivered for the same price? Certainly I wouldn't carry it home. The Birchall murder has police baffled. They know that her body was dumped on the banks of Throsby Creek, but they maintain she wasn't killed there. Police say prostitutes often bring their clients to this isolated area, and they haven't ruled out the possibility that she may have been killed in a car. Police divers from Sydney began the painstaking task of searching the murder at Throsby Creek with a long, thin-bladed knife, which police believe was the murder weapon. Police are now trying to trace her movements. This area of Islington was where Cheryl Birchall came to work as a prostitute on Wednesday night. She left home in Mayfield at about 9 o'clock and gave a man directions at about a quarter past 10. But that was the last time she was seen alive. A post-mortem held this morning established the time of death sometime between 10 o'clock and midnight. Detective Sergeant Jeff Wright says that as well as interviewing anyone have any of who may have seen Cheryl Birchall, they're also questioning other prostitutes about clients who ask for reverse or brutal sex. There has been uh, a few incidences of uh, violence down there which weren't reported to police previously, but now uh, one or two incidents have come to light, but uh, we're still continuing our inquiries in relation to those uh, matters. Police are asking the public to come forward with information. Cheryl was last seen wearing a mauve sloppy joe, light coloured track pants and black suede boots. Opening his latest exhibition, Norman Withers captures the spirit and beauty of Australia and its people. Included in the 34 works at the Hunter Heritage Gallery is the picturesque landscape of the Hunter Valley. For the 63-year-old photographer, a full-time hobby has become his colourful art form, but one that Norman says is not recognised enough by the critics. Just about anybody can use a camera, take a picture. Uh, but not everybody can pick up a paintbrush and do a painting. So that sort of person is rarer and more admired, I think, and recognised as an artist. But what a lot of people don't realise is that they can take a picture, but photography can go beyond that and be creative. Do you consider yourself more an artist or a photographer? Both. I think it is an art, but of course you've got to know the technical side of how to use a camera, you've got to know about lighting and how to use light and on the artistic side, you've got to have imagination, you've got to have an eye for beauty, 